Professor Hall, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, happy to be with you. Why don't we start with your background? Where did you get started? You know, the arc of your career and where are you now? Well, sure. I've had a 25 year career in federal service. Um, I've held a, a, actually a number of, of um, high level leadership positions, I would say, focusing on policy rather than politics. Um, I've had a presidential appointment, I've had a congressional appointment. Um, my jobs have included a uh, four year term as the director of the Congressional Budget Office a four-year term as the commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and then I've had uh, high-level chief economist positions at the White House Council of Economic Advisors for three years, at the Department of Commerce for a couple of years, and at the U.S. International Trade Commission. So I've gotten a chance to work in uh, a lot of different areas. So I've, I've been exposed to almost every part of the federal policymaking process. Um, it's a diverse set of jobs, but they have all been involved with what I call evidence-based public policy. And that's, that's my focus even now as an academic. And so where are you now? I'm at the uh, uh, McCourt School at uh, Public Policy at uh, Georgetown University. Great. And so uh, you mentioned this concept of uh, evidence-based policy is, is where you're your high level interests are. Can you kind of just explain what, what that is and how that's kind of guided your overall career choices and in, in, in your work? Sure, most of my jobs have been working directly for the actual policymakers. And, uh, and to some degree, I've, I've been a translator, right? I'm, I'm a technical economist, I have a PhD in economics from Purdue University. And I've, I've directed a lot of offices, research offices who keep up with current research, sort of the state of knowledge on different topics. And then to make that valuable, of course, you need, you need to be able to put that into a form that policymakers can understand and use to make decisions. So for example, at a place like the Congressional Budget Office, we are assessing the, the budgetary impact of legislation, but we're also assessing some policy options for policymakers. You know, we talk about, I don't know, um, a particular uh, programs uh, coming up for reevaluation, we would offer some, some possible policy changes, what the likely impact would be of some of those changes and sort of, um, sort of providing that information to policymakers. I, ideally, what, what you're doing in jobs like this is you're trying to, trying to help policymakers make more informed and better decisions over time. It's very hard to measure success, but, uh, you know, the, the old thing, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You can expose policymakers to a lot of great information. They have to, they have to pay attention to it and follow it. And, and for the most part, they do. So let's focus more of our time then on the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, since that's really where you know, overlaps with, uh, with the theme of our, of, of, our, uh, of our series here, focusing on Congress. And you know the CBO is is well known for doing for scoring bills, right? Uh, so can you take me through what that process is today, where how it's kind of evolved into this current state, and where do you see that scoring concept moving in the future? Okay, well actually CBO's work is remarkably like it was 40 years ago when it was created. Um, a budget process was set up uh, where uh, about 40, a little over 40 years ago, where the two budget committees of Congress were created. And they were set up to run the budget process. And part of that process is having the Congressional Budget Office do an analysis of any proposed piece of legislation. What would be the budgetary impact of that legislation, not just the next year, but over the next 10 years. And literally almost every piece of legislation before it goes to the floor of the House or the Senate should have a what's called a CBO score, which means CBO writes up sometimes a very long, sometimes a short memo on what they think would be the budgetary implications, how much it might raise spending or lower spending, how much it might change revenues up or down. Um, and it's purely informational. I think that's one of the interesting things, as much attention as CBO gets sometimes um, in, in perhaps constraining Congress, it's purely the information that's constraining, that's constraining them because CBO's in an advisory capacity, providing this information not only for uh, different committees, but it's primarily for the budget committee to then use to enforce their budgetary rules. 
And is the scoring done, uh, you know, for committees pretty much exclusively, or are there a set of members or senators who are also getting scored before they move to committee? Uh, now, now you're in actually a, 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 a difficult position for CBO sometimes. Certainly it was when I was there. We're, we're directed to work for the budget committee and to work for committees. So part of what happens then is you have individual members who have ideas, they are, haven't yet developed them enough to get support from a committee. And when I was a director, I'd get a phone call, say, hey, can you look at my bill? And the answer would be, uh, no, I'm sorry. You have to get a committee to, to ask us to work on that. And there, as much as, you know, CBO will work on the, the high when I was there, a thousand pieces of legislation, proposed pieces of legislation. There were thousands more that individual members would, would have liked us to look at, but we just didn't have the resources. Uh, and, and committees actually use the CBO process somewhat to, to control the process. They don't want us getting distracted in other things. Uh, we tried to, to sit down and informally help. I, I spent my time sitting in a member's office talking to them generally about things. We really couldn't score their legislation until they got enough support in a committee that it looked like it was going to go to the floor. Then, then we'd take it up at CBO. So what was that threshold in the committee? Was it that, it, as you say, it was going to be sort of be reported no matter what? Or would you put it, put it over the edge? You know, is it a majority of the committee members or is it totally depend on the whim of the Chairman of the committee. Chairman of the committee has lots of power. Chairman of the committee um, really, really determines where the staff of the committee really determines what a place like CBO works on. And the logic, of course, for CBO is that if a piece of legislation, a proposed piece of legislation, doesn't have enough support from a committee, it's not going to make it to the floor. And really, our task is to do an evaluation before it goes to the floor. So we would look to committees very much for guidance on, on setting up priorities and et cetera. Um, and there are times, again, where members want to have more of a say in what a committee is doing. They can even be members of the committee. And they just don't have standing to get CBO to do an evaluation, which, in a sense, it elevates legislation, right? Because it, it's on its way to the floor. Uh, one of the things that CBO always does is when a piece of legislation is, becomes public, they'll work on it privately up until it becomes public. And then everything we do would be on our website, send it out to Congress completely. The idea of, of, of working confidentially then pivoting to create a level playing field for members. But what we work on that was very much driven by, by committees. And just so I understand what's in the scoring process, you mentioned it, how it impacts the U.S. budget directly right. rather than indirect costs or benefits to the economy as a whole. Is that right? Well, well yes and no, <laughs> because the indirect effects very much can affect the budget itself. Right. So you have a piece of legislation that's that's in some way going to affect the behavior of the private sector, businesses and the economy, your individuals. Uh, if it affects their behavior in some way that's going to impact the budget, then it becomes important. One of the big issues um, when I first started for the first time, CBO was directed to do what's something that's called dynamic scoring, which means if a piece of legislation is so big, it could actually affect uh, economic growth from the whole country, then CBO would do a direct effect and then take a macroeconomic model and model the GDP effect as an indirect effect and add that to the direct effect. Um, it takes something pretty big to do that. But the, the idea is that you're always taking these indirect effects into account to the degree you can. Um, the limitation, of course, is that we're really ultimately lim interested in the budgetary impact. So there would be a section in all our, our reports about uh, how many mandates are created by this legislation, but there's not a lot of work on what exactly that means. It, it makes private sector do some things, but but we we didn't really didn't have the time or the or the mission to go into that in great detail. So it doesn't really calculate the cost or the changes to the private sector unless that would show back up into the budget. That's right. Now now there there are kind of exceptions, and 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 often it's because a committee wants an exception, 
um, CBO has done work on minimum wage laws. Well, if, if you just narrowly look at the effect of raising the national minimum wage to $15 an hour, that's really only affecting federal hiring. But there was a great deal of interest as to how that would affect the private sector, how would it affect wages, how would it affect employment, unemployment, how it would affect movements in and out of poverty. So that, that was much far beyond just the budgetary impact, but they had a particular interest in that and asked CBO to, to do that work. And in terms of the time frame, you mentioned 10 years. Um, now, how is this 10 years picked? It sounds, you know, patent is 20 years, you know, the congressman's two years, senator's six years. Where do we come up with 10 years? And do you think that makes sense? Or is, is that just an arbitrary number? Well, it is an arbitrary number. In fact, when CBO started, they were doing a five-year analysis. So the 10 years was, was, was what the budget committees wanted. A lot of what CBO does is what the budget committees want. Um, it was a deliberate attempt to try to make it long enough that you would capture a lot of the effects. Um, but you're absolutely right. This does invite at times what you might call budget maneuvering, where some budget uh, proposal would have a big effect in year 11 or 12. And I just tell you though, at, at CBO, we would catch that and put it in our memo. So you wouldn't get an official score that, that went beyond 10 years, but you have a little paragraph saying, you know, we think for the second 10 years, this is gonna have an effect in billions of dollars or something like that. So, so we did have the mandate to sort of flag things like that. Um, and to some degree, it, it's a trade-off. You, you, know, you have to have an arbitrary number. You have to have a number that you always work with. Um, if CBO did an analysis for five years, there'd be tricks in year six. If we had it for 10 years, there'd be tricks in year 11. Um, but as long as we're flagging it, we think that's important. And something to remember too, whatever CBO does, it, it almost always makes the news. Right? Uh, uh, normally it's, it's sort of nerdy budget news, but it's in the news and, and members of Congress pay attention to it, but they can ignore what CBO does. <laughs> They don't have to pay any attention to CBO, and they and they've at times just decided not not to do that when they wanted something badly enough and didn't want to feel constrained by by uh, uh, our work. So, so we've talked about individual scoring. What about in the in, in the beginnings of the budget process? You know, the kind of top down part. Um, what's CBO's role there? For sure. Well, one of the things that if you're going to uh, analyze pieces of legislation, you have to have to have some idea of the baseline. You know, where's the budget right now? So uh, a, a fair amount of CBO's time is creating a baseline forecast, 10-year forecast of the economy. And then on top of that, you have a 10-year forecast of the budget. So you now have this budget outlook on top of an economic outlook. It's for 10 years. It's under current law. And it's kept current. It's first created in, in January. In fact, that's sort of the kickoff of the budget process. CBO does their baseline, then they update it in the spring as more data becomes available and they keep that up all the time. Uh, people pay attention to that. It's sort of where you're going. And, and, and in fact, if you, if, if you wanna get depressed about how well Congress is doing and managing the federal budget, you, you can read that document and see just how poorly they're, they're, uh, uh, they're balancing the budget. They're just, they're just so far off, it's ridiculous. And another thing we also do once we also did once a year was a long-term budget outlook, which is a 30-year look ahead under current law. Um, and there you capture a real feel for just what the long-run trend is looking like under current law. Um, and I'll and I'll just say I, uh, the last four or five budget directors have characterized this long-term outlook as unsustainable. You simply can't accumulate that much debt without having some dramatic effect on the economy and the government and the, and the budget. And uh, the last four or five uh, Federal Reserve chairs have all said it's unsustainable. The General Accountability Office, GAO, says it's unsustainable. And this is based on that sort of that 30 year look uh, going forward. And, and we've been saying it for a long time. So let's talk a little bit about this concept of modeling the future, uh, since that really seems to be CBO's 
key job, right? Is modeling the future in a very particular way, you know, cash money flowing in and out of the government. Um, and, you know, this modeling of the future, you know, any model depends on kind of two elements. One is the model itself. Uh, and the other is the assumptions that go into making that model, right? On which the model is resting. So how does the CBO go about building that model, number one? And number two, how do they figure out what assumptions to use and what process do they use? Well, CBO spends a, a, a great deal of time looking at literature, looking at research literature. So they understand uh, as, as well as, as can be understood, I think, the likely impact of, of policy changes. Um, they, they develop models, they keep models ready. Um, there's a process whereby an estimate comes out of an individual to a, to a, a different levels within the, you know, to a division, to an office, and they all come through a, a very set process. They all come out of the director, director's office. And so it's had a lot of review by people who, who um, um, are being very sensitive that, we're, that we're, they're doing an objective, fair evaluation. Um, CBO has a, a prominent panel of economic advisors. In fact, if you get on their website, you'll just see a, just a, a ridiculously talented group of people who are willing to, to twice a year go come and sit down at CBO and talk about CBO's work and give CBO advice. And they make an effort. I, certainly when I was there, we made an effort to, that that's a diverse group. They're all experts, and, but they all have sort of different opinions on things, but they're primarily chosen for their technical abilities. And then last but not least, whenever there's time, uh, CBO would do its share of longer term studies. I mentioned the minimum wage study, Well, that took 18 months or so. Literally, CBO sends it out to a handful of experts, like it's a journal review, and gets, gets evaluations and comments from experts. That's actually one of the important roles that the advisory committee plays is we have their phone numbers <laughs> and we call them and ask them to help. And sometimes their help is giving us the names of experts around the country who should read our work and tell us if we're doing anything wrong, if we're being fair. Um, and ultimately the, the very last test is literally to look at the estimate and say, okay, are we just as likely to be too high as we are to be too low? We want to be in the middle of what we think is going to happen because the idea of an unbiased estimate is the most important thing to the folks at CBO, in addition, of course, to having as accurate an estimate as possible. I, I can go on because one of the things that CBO also does, which I think is fabulous, is they routinely evaluate their performance. You'll see their, their uh, evaluation of how they're doing at forecasting revenues. How are they doing at forecasting spending? How are they doing at forecasting the deficit? So you literally see, for example, I can tell you that on revenues, um, one or two years in advance, the average CBO estimate of the entire level of spending <coughs> is off by about 1.7%. You, you have a possibility of error. In there. Um, a big change that they've been pushing is to increase transparency. So now more and more CBO is creating a little appendix to the to work we do that has the model in it. Um, there's a practical aspect to it because sometimes you're working so quickly it's hard to do that. But we've set aside, we certainly increased our resources to do that. So for the most part, if you're curious about a CBO analysis, somewhere there, you'll see the model if you like. And in enough detail that if you're uh, technically capable, you can, you can try to reproduce the result. Uh, and that's being done on purpose. And that, that's something that, that members of Congress were very interested in. And, and CBO's <clears throat> taken a, a great pains to increase their transparency in that sense. I mean, you can imagine a process. I mean, it sounds like your current process is really expert driven and then with some peer review. Yes. Um, now, you could imagine a process where every assumption was kind of broadcast to the market and then, or, or you know, a variable was put out in the market and you let 5,000 economists, you know, trade it and put it into some 
synthetic number based on you know consensus. Uh, so that would be a more open driven process. Um, you know that, that that could you know model the assumptions in a way that you know individuals might not necessarily do. Um, have those kinds of ideas ever come up? You know, or is it really thought to be kind of an expert-driven process within CBO? Uh, we, we're, we're actually they're actually trying to do more of what, what exactly what you described. Uh, members more and more are, are wanting us to, to lay out what your assumptions are. That's that's fair. Um, again, the idea being, if you put out the model, you talk about the assumptions, the model estimates, talk about your evidence, um, then you're, you're enabling people to replicate the work if, if they want to. Um, one of the things we actually try to do more and more, and you'll see it now on, on CBO's website, is create interactives. <clears throat> so you have a model that creates an answer and you'll let them change one of those important variables and see how it affects the estimate. Um, that really is very much targeted towards uh, congressional uh, committee staff so that they can play around a little bit with that. Uh, but at, one of the fundamentals though still is what the budget committees want is a point estimate from CBO that they can use to enforce their budget rules. And if CBO gives them a range that just messes that up and it lets members pick and choose what they want to pick. So CBO makes a point estimate, but then try, try to make the, the uncertainty clear, try to make the, the assumptions clear so that if you wanted to spend the time and had the expertise, you could, you could work up your own, your own versions if you like. So let's talk more then about the, the budget process itself. Mm -hmm. um, obviously you've been deeply involved in it uh, from the inside and you've observed it from the outside. Um, where is, you know, what's the process now or lack thereof? What, how can it be improved? There is a very specific process. There are specific deadlines and Congress doesn't follow. They, they set their own rules. They set their own deadlines, but there, there's, no, there's no accountability for going past them. So I would say it, it, it's really not an exaggeration to say that the budget process is a, a complete mess. Um, in fact, I may be biased, but others have this opinion. The, maybe the only part of the process that works well is CBO produces nice unbiased estimates. Other than that, Congress doesn't follow the rules. They don't get things done. Um, I'll give you, for example, part of the process, well, the process should result in what are called appropriations bills. There should be about a dozen appropriations bills setting out spending for the next year, about a dozen of them on, on the various categories. All right. Those bills are due to be done and passed in June. Okay, This year, they still aren't done. This is not June. Uh, and the last time all the appropriations bills were finished on time was 1997. So they just absolutely don't follow their budget process. Uh, and they're Congress, they don't, they don't have to. So I think there are lots of changes that could be make, made in the budget process. But the most important one is whatever they do, they ought to try following the process. Um, because right now, uh, it just doesn't get done. Um, and I think part of what we pay for it is we have these continual fights and they're, they're literally deciding spending in a crisis mode. It's always a crisis mode. They're never thinking beyond the current upcoming budget year and they don't get to plan, they don't do anything like that. And we pay a price with that and the outcomes are outrageously bad. We overspent our revenues. The federal government overspent its revenues by 80% last year, 80%, that's almost twice. This year, they're gonna overspend their revenues by about 68%. So they're running up, they just, they just now have, have borrowed $6 trillion in the last two years because they aren't thinking ahead. They're just in crisis mode trying to get a budget passed. And in recent years, it's getting a budget passed to deal with a pandemic all in a crisis mode without any, any thinking about how you're gonna pay this money back. 
uh, what's going to happen five years from now or 10 years from now. Uh, I think that's a real problem. Um, and I think we're going to pay a, a very dear price for that at some point because the debt is getting, getting so high. Yeah, and I've talked with many guests in the past about this problem. And, you know, it's, in my mind, it's baked into the structure of Congress itself. You know, there, there's only two and six year terms, right? There's really no incentive for them to think beyond those terms if they define representation as only representing their current constituents, right? Unless they have a long-term view of representation, there's a built-in logic to borrow from the future and from other, you know, take from others. Uh, to give to the current voters. But in terms of the process that you mentioned, you know, you said, you know, there could be improvements to the process, but they have to follow a process. They have to follow whatever process they said they got to follow it. Um, what are the mechanisms to make them follow a process? Is there one or, you know, are there automated term, you know, teeth you can put into a process so that if they don't act, you know, stuff happens? Uh, I mean, you can try, you know, um, you know, I think one thing is, is increased transparency. You know, if you talk to the average person, all they know is come the fall, there's no budget. They don't, they don't know that all these deadlines have been missed. Um, they don't know any of that stuff that's happened. Um, nobody's looking at the longer term um, uh, look at things besides CBO. They're, they're doing this longer term forecast, but um, People need to pay more attention to that. Um, I would force them to force them to set out some medium-term and long-term goals. You know, it's not just what's going to be the budget next year, but they have to have a medium-term and long-term goal, and they have to do an evaluation of where they are in meeting that goal. That just isn't happening right now. Um, some of the accountability things. You know, one of the things that happens, of course, is um, you run into the, 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 the debt ceiling and you run into caps and et cetera. Those are all efforts to, to enforce things. And they just wave them. Just decide, okay, we aren't gonna be serious about that this year. There are things we wanna do instead. So I don't know, it's, it's really hard, it's really hard to, to force accountability on things. Uh, um, you see proposals, for example, to try a two-year budget. Um, that might help some, at least they won't be fighting every year, they'll fight every other year. Um, but to me, a lot of what's at the heart of it is this winner take all approach to things. Um, all of these uh, budget, all of the budget legislation, setting the annual budget out, it's been decades since any minority member voted for it. It's all majority. There's no minority uh, is pulled in there. They're not, there's no negotiation going on. There's no bipartisan dealing with the budget. It's always whoever's in power, they do it entirely by themselves. Um, and and you know, it's hard to imagine you're gonna get anywhere as long as that's, that's what's happening. That's gonna undermine any process, I believe. But if it's really true, that it's the majority party that's really not coming, if it's a winner take all system, which let's, for now, let's just assume it is, uh, then it's really a single party that's having trouble coordinating and their committee chairman then that it's the committee members and the committee chairs then that in theory should be accountable if they're the ones that are really deciding and the minority is kind of sidelined anyway. Well, well, that's right. And if you can think of a way to, to really make them accountable, I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think there are things that, that might help. You know, we always, when the, when the end of the fiscal year comes up, uh, uh, October 1st, and there's no budget, there's a budget shortfall, right? There's just threat to close the government down. And then they fight over what's called a continuing resolution, how to extend our deadline. Again, they're extending their deadline. And that becomes part of the negotiation. I'd be fine with the idea of an automatic continuing resolution. If you don't meet the deadline, something automatic kicks in. So they aren't fighting about that. Um, but again, that's, those are, those are fairly modest things. Um, a lot of it, I think is, is just what's well, beyond me. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a policy guy. Um, but the culture is just such that they just, they just don't work nearly enough across the aisle with each other. And what about the relationship between the, the chairman, uh, 
of a committee and the speaker, right? Because a lot of people talk about, you talk about the, the committees as being all powerful uh, in this process, but on the other side, you, you hear a lot of people saying that the committees are weaker uh, and that the speaker or the cent- leadership has taken most of the responsibility and the chairman have become you know, more beholden to their desires and needs. Do you see that play out in real life or is it still kind of the chairman's the one uh, with, you know, in, in the speakers kind of on the sideline. When something becomes big and important, then the leadership can just take over. Um, probably the biggest single um, uh, thing that we dealt with at CBO when I was there was the attempt to repeal and replace the ACA. And that was run in both houses entirely by leadership. Um, particularly on the Senate side, um, I, I caught such, I had so many phone calls. The leadership was running the legislation. They were working back and forth with, with the Congressional Budget Office, who was evaluating their ideas and getting the legislation set up. And they asked us to do it confidentially so we couldn't share it with anybody. I was getting phone calls from senators from both parties demanding to know what we were working on. And my answer was, it's above my pay grade, go talk to leadership, right? So that was a deliberate strategy to cut out all the committees and cut out everybody else and to throw out a piece of legislation and make them vote on it right away. There were no hearings, there was no discussion. There were, there were plenty of members who would have loved to have some input and make some changes in that legislation. Uh, and they just weren't allowed to do that. That's a, that's a terrible way to do it. And you, you saw on the, certainly on the Senate side that failed miserably because they didn't get the votes because they had, they had uh, members bail on it. They got no minority votes and they didn't get all the majority votes because they, they weren't involved at all in the process. Um, I don't know how you avoid that sort of, that sort of game uh, when, when they can take over like that. So in that case, CBO does respond directly to leadership and in, as well as the committees then. That's right. That's right. It's, it's whoever's going to have um, authority over the legislation. If legislation is going to come out of the budget committee, we work with the budget committee. But if, if the leadership is going to handle it and they, they're the ones passing legislation drafts to the CBO, they can ask for it to be confidential. And right away, that just cuts out the, uh, the, uh, the committees. I, I, I've had an angry uh, chairman of the budget committee call me to want tell me what are you working on? You work for us, and the answer is, not now. <laughs> we're working for leadership. You need to talk to uh, you need to talk to somebody besides us. We're we're only we're only playing our role. <laughs> so let's go back to this notion of of time again and mm-hmm. representation. So you know you mentioned that members are obviously very short-sighted and even in talking to some members and some and, and senators on, on my program, you know, I asked them about um, who do they consider their constituents. It's at best, it's their whole district or their whole state. And at best it includes, you know, some, the, some of the kids in school. Uh, we're not talking, you know, grandkids. We're not talking three generations down uh, in terms of how they conceive of representation in the current context. And so, it would make sense for them to maximize takings from the future to, to give to the present, right? Um, and run those, those, those deficits, you know, especially if the cost is low, right? Because of the interest rates, what have you. So, I mean, you must have been thinking about this a long time. Do you see a way around this problem other than reconception of the notion of representation by the, by the members? I think that's a, I think that's a, a really tough thing. Um, these things are, are, are fairly complicated. You know, you're looking years into the future, you're looking at, at things that, that the average voter is just not going to understand. Um, and when I talked to colleagues in the sense of other people who are very concerned about the budget and the budget process, first of all, they're all very concerned. <laughs> there's, there's no disagreement on this. Um, it's an unsustainable thing. They talk about, gee, how do we frame this problem in a way that voters will understand, that individuals will understand who, who maybe they can then pressure their members of Congress to do that. 
I just think that's an impossible thing. Um, I think what you need is, is, is actually real leadership, real congressional leadership is somebody who is going beyond the, the fall next year or the following year, who actually sees the issue as a long-term issue and actually works to bring Congress around to these things and maybe brings their, their voters around to these things. Because there are real issues sort of sitting out there um, and members of Congress just don't even address them. I, well, we just had a presidential election. How much did you talk did you hear about budget deficits and debt? Doesn't get you elected. And it takes leadership to push something in new in, into, into the debate like that, or, or even off uh, years to actually put some resources into thinking about it. Uh, Congress just really needs to, first thing they need to do is really set up some, some goals, some long-term goals. Um, I don't know how many times I, I, I've been asked, certainly when I was CBO director, exactly when is too much debt too much? They're going to ask, well, when's the crisis coming? The answer is, you don't know. <laughs> it's a crisis. It's coming. It's a debt bomb out there. But I can't tell you when it is. And you know why they're asking? They want to wait to the last minute and deal with it on a crisis mode. Well, that, that's no way to govern. That's not leadership. What about increasing the cost of borrowing from the future? Is that a viable way? You know, straight line pay back the debt instead of paying it back at the end of the bond? You know, what... What other ways are there to increase the cost of borrowing? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Um, you know, one of the issues right now, which I, I find really annoying, is interest rates are low, so people think borrowing is free. Interest rates don't stay low. They're going to go up. <laughs> and once they go up, $20 trillion worth of debt is going to get very expensive. Uh, and it's going to be spending. It's going to be secret spending. It's going to happen without anybody doing anything. Um, sort of thing I think would be helpful. I, I think I think uh, Congress is really bad at exercising fiscal policy. Right? We went through the Great Recession, ran up a huge debt. We just went through the pandemic, ran up a huge debt. But there's nothing that forced us to now run a surplus and pay back some of that money. Uh, one of the things I'm beginning to, to be a fan of, I'd like to think through more, is the idea of automatic stabilizers, right? There are already automatic stabilizers in the sense that when the economy uh, weakens, tax revenues go down. Well, that's, that's a stimulus. Um, spending goes up. Unemployment insurance payments go up. Well, spending goes up, taxes go down. That actually provides stimulus to help, to help ease the pain of, a, of an economic recession. The problem with it being discretionary is once it's done and the economy is doing well, do you pay it back or do you pass it forward to the next generation? And we're always doing the latter. I like the idea of automatic stabilizers, where these are things that automatically stimulate the economy, but then they also automatically pay it back without any congressional action once the economy is now growing strong. So, for example, if you go through a period of where tax revenues are down, then you ought to have some sort of automatic mechanism where tax revenues go up for a while to pay it back. Um, same thing with spending. If you're going to increase spending, then you ought to have something that reduces spending for a while afterwards. It, it, it's, not, it's not impossible. Um, 49 out of 50 states have a balanced budget requirement. And so when we just had this nice economic growth before the pandemic, a number of states ran rainy day funds. They ran surpluses and held the money for the next recession, which turned out to be the pandemic. Federal government didn't do that at all. So what I'm talking about now is trying to think of some sort of mechanism that makes the federal government do this, that creates a, a some, somewhat of a rainy day fund when the economy is going well. We just, we just blew some opportunity to do that right before the pandemic. And I'll just say too, I'm being on my soapbox a bit, sorry. The whole world has now gone into high debt because of the pandemic. Some countries are smarter 
and ran surpluses before the pandemic because the economy was going well. We didn't, but those countries did. I think there's something maybe we can try to learn from those countries. I don't know how they did it, some of them that did it, but they were able to do it. They, they had some leadership to do it. Um, I think it's possible, uh, but I think, you have to, I think you have to plan. You have to set up some institutions because things are just, the, 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 the basic process and relying on, on Congress and the president to act on their own doesn't really work well. So agreed. Why don't we go back to this concept of the um, of the costs of legislation? Because one of them is the debt. Obviously, that's that's a very clear one to quantify, uh, and one that continues to grow. And it's easy to measure it. Well, easier to measure it uh, under its different different ways to measure it, but it's measurable. The other one I'm interested in, and your thought on the CBO's role, is what we mentioned earlier. If there's legislation you score it, you're scoring it according to the US budget implications. But in, I, I can imagine a scenario where you pass a piece of legislation, it's pretty neutral on the US budget, but it creates an enormous cost for industry, right? right. Uh, and maybe reduces innovation, you know, it has all kinds of costs in the real world. It just doesn't have a lot of costs to the US government. Um, is CBO, do you think CBO should have a role to try to quantify those kinds of costs as well? Or is that the role of some other body or lobbyists or citizens to do that? Do you think that's something that the CBO should take on as well? Well, on one hand, I, I agree. A, a CBO type analysis of that would be really helpful. And I'd like to see it. But on the other hand, CBO is really busy with the budgetary impact. <laughs> and one of the things that I think is fairly amazing is CBO has been around for 40 odd years and they've remained pretty, they've remained very objective, they've remained very professional, whatever they're doing works. I don't want to mess with that. And so I would worry that you put them into another line of business, you may ring what you have working for CBO. I'll tell you a for real proposal that was out there for a little while when, when I was at CBO. There was some push by some to maybe have CBO do an evaluation of regulation. Well, that was my next question because it's the same issue, right? Yeah. And, you know, having CBO take on regulation, okay, you're, you're talking about doubling the size of CBO, <laughs> pulling them into some things that are even more politically charged than they are now. Um, I like the idea of somebody doing that. I, I in fact, I wouldn't mind seeing a CBO-like organization that evaluates legislation for Congress. It would be a Congress's little organ baby organization like CBO is. I think that sort of thing would, would work great. You could do that. I just, I just don't want to overburden CBO and maybe ruin what works with CBO because it's one of the few things in my mind that, that works well in, in, in Washington. So what about the... Um you know, the concept of innovation and productivity in the economy. So this is another thing that I'm quite interested in understanding, especially particularly as it relates to CBO. So you can imagine, for instance, let's say there's another infrastructure bill that, I, you know, that focuses on infrastructure. And, and, you know, one example is like, you know, they talk about the highway system, you know, the interstate system had a big, it was a major contributor to U.S. productivity growth uh, after it was constructed, Right. Uh, and long into the future. Uh, so there is a set of things that the US government spends money on that can be measured in theory uh, in terms of productivity gains for the whole country, right? Right. Now, most of those impacts, I would assume, were, are, would be more than 10 years, first of all. And second of all, I don't even think that's a real goal of the legislation when they, you know, they don't say we're gonna invest in a road system so that we can get 3% increase in productivity, although that would be the outcome everybody actually wants. Right. So can you talk about the, this concept of, um, can you just elaborate on this idea? How is it thought of at CBO in terms sure. of productivity of the nation and what it means? Well, first of all, I mentioned the idea of dynamic scoring. So if you have legislation that you think may affect economic growth, and, and in theory, that's what infrastructure might do, and that should be a part of the analysis. 
Um, so you have your, you can estimate pretty well what the direct spending would be on infrastructure, but you now have this indirect effect of, gee, it's, it's gonna spill over, potentially increase private sector productivity. What's gonna happen there? Well, CBO has done a fair amount of work anticipating some infrastructure legislation. Even when I was there, we were doing that work. Um, and there were a few punchlines that come up, I would say are, are, are valid with that. Number one, really hard to do <laughs> because you don't have a, a lot of experience with doing this, right? You, you know that building the, the uh, interstate highway system was really valuable, but spending a little extra on it, how valuable is that? That's really hard to do. Um, CBO looked at the broad category of federal investment. So rather than try to look at particular pieces of, of possible infrastructure investment, we looked at it broadly. Just generally, if you raise federal investment infrastructure generally, how much of an impact does that have? And then a few, a few conclusions from that. Okay, one is if the federal government increases spending on infrastructure, states reduce their spending. So, so your net effect is, is much less than you think it's gonna be. Um, second is whatever impact federal investment infrastructure has on, on infrastructure, it's about half, it's about half the productivity effect of the private sector. So if you give a dollar to uh, the federal government to spend on infrastructure, by their rough estimate, you get five cents back in GDP growth. All right, so that means two things. It means one, it's not very high. And second, if it was, you gave a dollar to the private sector to invest, they get you 10 cents back in GDP growth. So, so you got that, you got, you got that to think about. Of course, there are things that only the federal government can invest in. So you can't just all give it to the private sector. And the last thing, their last punchline, which I, I, is, is maybe the most important, if you invest in infrastructure, it really depends upon how you finance it. If you spend a dollar in infrastructure and you reduce spending by a dollar in something else, you get a much better outcome than if you borrow that dollar. In fact, if you, if you spend a dollar in infrastructure and you borrow that dollar, the negative impact of borrowing a dollar is actually bigger than the positive impact of the infrastructure investment. So that's, that's maybe their biggest punchline is pay for it. Um, it may well be that the current administration sees that because they've made an effort to talk about infrastructure and talk about a plan on changing, raising taxes to try to pay for it. Well, that's sort of feeding into, I think, what CBO's punchline is. If you're going to invest in infrastructure, you want to have an impact on productivity. Don't borrow because that you're going to have a, a bigger drag from borrowing than you will from the infrastructure investment. And it's really hard the, to do. Is the goal increase in productivity or is it some other kind of, I mean, you, you use the word economic growth right. versus productivity. I guess they're two different concepts in economics. And right. one of them I would think is more appropriate than the other. But what, how does that play out? Well, for CBO, you need to know the productivity thing because uh, if you spend money on infrastructure and you get stronger economic growth, that's positive revenue effect. So you actually get the idea that spending money in infrastructure might partially pay for itself, even though you may not think, you, you shouldn't realistically think it's going to pay entirely for itself. But if it pays for 10% of itself, that's something, and that's something they need to take into account. They did that with the tax cuts, the 20, uh, 2017 tax cuts. Um, lower taxes give you higher economic growth, and that in part pays for part of itself. And that was an important part of CBO's analysis was this figuring exactly how much. Um, and we really pushed back on the idea that tax cuts could fully pay for themselves, just like I would push back that infrastructure could fully pay for itself, but it, if it pays for a little bit of it or some of it, then that makes a difference. And does R&D spend and infrastructure spend, is that the same concept in your mind when it comes to 
productivity growth. You know, I worked at the NIH for a while, you know, it's, it's a, it's a much different kind of, uh, you know, calculation, I would assume, but at the end of the day, the outcome may be the same, which is increased productivity. Yeah. What you're that's pointing out is just how crude CBO's measurement of investment really has to be. They can't just focus on research and development because the, the data and the research just isn't there. They can't just focus on highway infrastructure. They can't just focus on ports and airports. So they've taken this very broad approach where they look at, at just broad spending overall. How much impact do that, does that have? So you have to admit that increased spending that's targeted on R&D or targeted on something else may have a dramatically different impact than CBO is estimating. Um, but they just don't have, you know, what's the term? There are a bunch of unknown unknowns here. So I noticed when I looked at the CBO's report, I think it was when, when uh, you were there, uh, and I saw that I think there were 40 economists covering healthcare, for instance. Right. Um, if you tripled them, would you be able to do those kinds of analyses on the R&D side? Um, no. no. <laughs> and, and I can tell you, CBO for years now has been trying to look at the evidence and look at research um, well, well before we had specific infrastructure proposals, trying their best to understand this, you know, the, the state of the art on research on this. And it's a, it can be a topic that's raised in their um, economic advisory panels where you're getting the best, mostly academic minds in the, in the country thinking about these things looking for evidence on it. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting um, was in the field of healthcare. Um, I would occasionally, I loved that, I would occasionally get a call from a member of Congress who had talked to some healthcare researchers who had some evidence they thought that should inform some of CBL's estimates of particular healthcare legislation. I loved it, point them at us, we'll talk to them. If it's valid work, <laughs> We'd love to include it in. Um, quite often it isn't because they don't understand fully, you know, what, what, the, what we're working with. But, um, you know, I, I thought an important thing that we, we tried to do every time we had our meetings with our, 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 our advisory panel is throw out to them, hey, we got lots of research questions we'd love to have you guys do work on that would make our estimates in the future better. Um, yeah, we at least had one or two. I at least had one or two members come up to tell me they were they were putting graduate students PhD thesis on the topics. Um, that's a really long, long way to get at it. But but if the if the research isn't there, the evidence isn't there, you can't you can't apply it. So my last question related to your CBO time was, you know, what was it like personally to be in that position? I mean. It, must have been tough going up against the, the committees and, and going through the process and then managing all those incoming. You know, can you give us a flavor of what it's like to be in that role? What were the challenges? You know, what, you know, did you give up hope? Did you see hope? Did you, uh, did you enjoy it? Did you, were you miserable? You know, what was the, your general feeling in being in that role for, for the time you were? Well, first, I thought one of my most important jobs was that uh, analysts at CBO needed to be able to work and the, do their work, make their best decisions, do their technical work as they thought best, and not worry about being yelled at by a member of Congress. It was my job <laughs> to go get yelled at by a member of Congress. So there are lots of topics there where, where especially on health care, where Congress was getting, um, and, and the, the administration, current administration at the time, was getting pretty offensive towards CBO. And a lot of the job I thought was, was shielding folks from that, that, that they can say what they want. That's just part of being disappointed in what CBO does, but to continue to do your work. Um, it's a shame to have to spend that much time doing that, but, but that's okay. That's part of the gig. Uh, I even, we even brought in people like, sometimes it would be reporters who were really big fans of CBO, bring them in there to tell CBO folks how much how much value their work has. 
to understanding the real terms. So shielding them from Congress, I thought was a really important part. Um, I'd say the most discouraging part though, is providing Congress with all this, you know, blood, sweat and tears is really hard work, getting the best numbers we can. And then they just blow up their budget process. They don't balance the budget. They run deficits that are just out of control. It, it, it certainly made me come away with feeling like, well, why did I go to all this trouble? They really aren't taking advantage of this information. It's not from lack of information. Uh, it, it's from, from their own lack of, of will and leadership. And uh, to, to, to me would be do the right thing and, and, and sort of push in some longer term planning in what they do. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll move on to the next phase of our discussion, which is where I ask questions that, uh, of all our guests and so I can later compare the answers. So you ready to move on? Sure. Uh, so, you know, this one obviously relates to your previous comment, but what do you think congressional representation should mean? Um, I really do think it, it, it needs to mean more in the way of leadership. You know, they need to show more leadership. Um, I don't think it, you're, you're representing your constituents if you're only thinking about what's the current crisis, deal with the current crisis. Um, getting themselves to think beyond the current crisis, I think is just really important. And if you're really gonna do, in my mind, the right thing is you're gonna show some leadership and work on some things that are beyond the, the now. Um, I, I really do think that's something that that um, effective congressional leadership really needs to needs to do. And to the kind of the fundamentals on the leadership question as well, it sounds like you a member should met, you know, represent their whole district versus the party versus their primary voters. Well, that's right. That's right. And and sometimes it's 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 thinking about the country, to be honest. You know, it, it's, um, I, I'll, I'll draw an analogy to, to managing a group. You got somebody who's a first line manager in a, in a small division. Well, it's their job to manage the division, but it's also their job to work with their colleagues and help out the office. It's also their job to work more broadly with the organization, to help out the organization. They aren't just worried about the people who are direct reports. I think a member of Congress needs to, to, not, to not just worry about the actual voters who voted for them, but also beyond that, and think about the country as a whole and the functioning of Congress as a whole. And what's your perspective on the future generations? Um, you know, as someone who's thinking about the budget and the long term and doing those 30 year projections, you know, is it the people who are living in the district now? Is it their kids? Is it their grandkids? Is it 30 years out? Who are they representing when it comes to time? Uh, I, we really are. Um, creating a problem for future generations. We really are. Um, uh, and I just don't think they're thinking about that well. I think, I think maybe everybody has a, has a tendency, certainly members of Congress seem to have a tendency to go talk to people who are telling them what they wanna hear, which is not necessarily an unbiased objective view on things. Um, I really do think that we really are creating problems for future generations. Um, I would like to see a lot more work focusing on what exactly we're now pushing to a future generation. Um, I know of, I, I, I think sometimes a little bit of an analogy with, with global warming. If you're a big believer in global warming and you think we're creating problems, what's well, problems for 30 plus years away? It's not problems for right now. I think we're kind of doing the same thing with, with federal debt. It's not a problem. It's not going to blow up tomorrow. It's not going to blow up in a, even a decade. And maybe not in 30 years, but at some point it's going to blow up. You're creating a, a big intergenerational transfer um, th that I wish we, I'd like to see more work um, detailing exactly what that probably means. I, you know, I think it probably means a lower standard of living for future generations as a result of this. Yeah, I agree that the, the budget question and the climate question are the same, uh, even though they're uh, approached by different groups in different ways. Um, 
Great. Well, let's move to the next one, which is how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? And by that, I mean in D.C. versus the district uh, on legislation versus oversight. You know, how would you break it down? Two weeks on, one week off. What? You know, I don't know if you've seen any of those proposals or how you would perceive their their allocation. Oh, gosh. You know, I, I, I just want to see him spend more time thinking ahead <laughs> and planning ahead. You know, you, you get these these committees that are that are put together to try to amend the budget process. Well, I think they need more of that sort of thing. I think they need to think in terms of of how to set forward medium term and long term goals. You know, um, the, maybe the most important power Congress has is the power of the purse. And and for them to exercise that power, they actually actually have to. <laughs> Have to think about things. They actually have to think it through, um, and not work on crisis management. So get, I get out of the crisis management mode. Part of why the, some of the suggestions I made were doing what you can to automatically deal with crisis, to free up time for members of Congress to think beyond a crisis. And now think about where you want to be in ten years, where you want to be in thirty years, that sort of thing. All right, next, next question is, uh, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? Well, certainly they ought to force themselves to do it. <laughs> they, they ought to force themselves to reach across the aisle. They just don't seem to do that. Um, I don't know, you, you get big pieces of legislation like the ACA or the tax cuts. There weren't any hearings this time. How can you possibly have a big piece of legislation like that and have no public hearings, you hear from experts, hear the debate, that's just, that's just irresponsible to me, um, that, that you don't do that sort of thing. Um, and, and the result is a, re a real lack of transparency. So it sounds like you, you want there to be more open debate, in, or at least open hearings. What about in terms of closed sessions did you have did you find those and i don't know if you never did any but you know did you find those more productive more more insightful uh is that something that should be encouraged more as closed door sessions within members so they can talk to each other without the cameras on yeah uh, we i got to do a few of those and, and i loved it i thought it was great um they still have a habit of you know having me in to talk to just the democrats of this committee <laughs> or just the republicans of this committee um, and I made a real effort to try to, to try to get them to make it bipartisan so I could talk about issues that, that we thought were going on. To the degree we could do that, I'd love to be able to do more of that. Um, we also made a real effort to target staff. The Congressional Research Service is already set up to provide training for staff. Well, CBO started to go in and, and partner with the Congressional Research Service and set up budget training for committee staff. I thought that was extremely valuable to be able to do that. I hope they keep doing that, that sort of work. Um, so, so at least people are, are informed about what the issues are. And, and you know, there just aren't enough set of common facts that people are, are dealing with. They're, they're there. They just don't seem to recognize what the common facts are and what we know about some of these, some of these policies and some of these things. So the next question is, what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Oh. Well, you're just getting beyond me. <laughs> I mean, uh, you're doing you're the you're dealing with 30 year uh, projections. So that's that's much longer than most people I'm talking to. Well, that's true. That's true. I, you know, one of the reasons why I like the idea of and Congress works better if they, if Congress can agree on goals. You know, if you make them make them agree on, on policies, that's much harder to do, but if they can just start by agreeing on goals, this is where we want to be in 30 years and agree on that as a first step. I think that's going a long way. And then you can, you can talk policies, you can talk about ways to get there as sort of a secondary thing. Um, and I think you can assess where you are. You know, every year there's a state, state of the union address from the president. Well, there needs to be some sort of state of the budget evaluation done, perhaps every year, about what things are looking like. And, and, and most importantly, 
How are you progressing towards your stated goal? You guys have agreed on a goal. How are you progressing towards that goal? I think that would be helpful. I'd like to see that. Right. Next one is what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? Gosh, I'm, I'm not sure it was any one in particular. I, I've always found <clears throat> the insight of Alice Rivlin to be great. She was the very first director of the Congressional Budget Office. She was the director 40 years ago. She was just a huge contributor, <clears throat> excuse me, in creating the credit Congressional Budget Office, creating the process. And she's had these great recommendations on how they can, how they can improve the process and improve things. I thought, I thought going back and reading her stuff is just very valuable. You know, for, she had ideas like um, the budget committees are too much out there on their own. She wanted to force leadership to have to serve on the budget committee, to form committee chairs to have to serve on the budget committee. So they would be involved from day one in the budget process and not be waiting at the end. I thought that's, a, I think that's a great political, political sort of solution to some of this, don't know how it'd work, um, but but I think her thinking on it was was uh, um, maybe better than anybody's. Right. Well, the last question is really about your plans. Uh, obviously, you're you're at Georgetown now. What what's what's in the future for you in terms of either scholarship or more public service? You know, what do you have planned? Well, you know, I, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed the teaching. Um, I've enjoyed it more now that I can actually see students live and in person. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I feel like I feel like in teaching I'm I'm uh, I, I'm building better evidence-based policy. I feel like if nothing else, I'm building better customers for people like the CBO and people who are doing really helpful research work. I think that's important. Uh, I like doing that. So I'd like to continue to do that. I, I don't know what sort of public service I would want to do. I, I feel like I've done almost everything. Um, and and I've, I have felt a little, little burned out from my CBO time. Um, living through interesting times at CBO, I think was, was uh, uh, has had a long-term effect on me. Uh, well, Professor Hall, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thank you, it. I enjoyed talking with you. Thank you.